Hi everybody and welcome back to a new video on the Mirror Lesson channel. In this episode, I'm going to show you an in-depth comparison between the Sony A7 Mark III and the A7 Mark IV. And the video you're watching right now is all about photography. If you're interested in the movie capabilities of these two cameras, then you will find a link to the second part of our comparison in the description of this video once it becomes available. All right, let's get started. Here are the two cameras, the A7 III and the A7 IV, which are full frame mirrorless cameras and part of the Sony E-mount system. I made this comparison with firmware 4.1 and 1.0 respectively, which were the latest versions available at the time of publishing this video. The two cameras are dust and moisture resistant. The A7 IV is a bit larger in comparison to the A7 III, but the weight is almost identical. They look very similar, but there are some changes on the new model and for the most part, these changes match what Sony did on other products like the A7R Mark IV and A9 Mark II. The A7 IV has a larger and taller front grip that allows your fingers to rest more comfortably. The indentation is a bit more pronounced as well and I find it less tiring to use the camera with large lenses like the 200 to 600 mm. It's not a perfect grip, but I welcome the improvement nonetheless. The buttons on the A7 IV have better tactile feedback, they are more precise to use, and the AF1 button is larger. I also find the dials to be a bit more precise, and for example, the rear dial is positioned outside of the main frame, so there is more surface to grab onto. Both cameras feature an AF joystick, the one on the A7 IV has a different texture and loses the concave shape, which I find more pleasant to use. Reactivity and precision are more or less the same. The exposure compensation dial can be customized on the A7 IV and it also comes with a lock button to prevent unwanted changes while working. The A7 III has a normal exposure compensation dial with white markings on top. Another addition on the new camera is a secondary dial found underneath the main shooting mode dial that allows you to switch between photo and video mode. On the A7 III, all the shooting modes, including video, are found on the top dial. Both cameras have 12 custom buttons that can be configured independently for still and video. You will also find the memory call option, and the A7 IV has three available on the main dial, whereas the A7 III has two. The A7 IV has a few extra options when it comes to customization. I'm not going to mention all of them, but an interesting thing is that you can change basic settings independently when you are in photo or video mode. For example, if I go from an aperture of f2.8 to 5.6, while I'm in video mode, the same change won't appear when I go back to still mode, where it's still 2.8. This can be applied to other settings, which is useful if you often switch between still and video on the same shooting and don't want to use the same parameters for both. The A7 IV inherits the latest menu design, which is much better organized than the old menu found on the A7 III. The settings and functions in the menu change accordingly when you go from photo to video mode and vice versa. Both cameras have the My Menu option, but the A7 IV offers an additional page, meaning you can save more settings. The viewfinder is the same when it comes to size and magnification, but the resolution has increased to 3.69 million dots and the refresh rate also goes up to 120 Hz on the A7 IV. It's a good upgrade overall and the eye point is long enough on the two cameras to compose with ease when wearing glasses like I do. The rear LCD screens have a similar resolution but the mechanism is different. The one on the A7 III tilts up and down whereas on the A7 IV you can flip the monitor to the side and rotate it 180 degrees. Both monitors are touch sensitive, but on the A7 III you can only move the autofocus point or double tap to activate magnification. With the new menu system on the A7 IV, you can use your finger to navigate the menu or even change settings in the function menu. Another interesting option is that you can instruct the A7 IV to go in standby mode when the monitor is closed and wake up the camera when it is open again. Another thing you can do on the A7 IV is to leave the shutter curtains closed when the camera is turned off. The idea is to protect the sensor when changing lenses and it is a copy and paste idea from the Canon EOS R. 
Keep in mind that these curtains are delicate, and some people believe they can be harmed more easily than the sensor itself. Even Sony gives you a warning message when you activate it. Concerning the physical connection, there is a full-size HDMI port on the new camera versus micro HDMI on the 7.3. They both have audio in and out and a USB-C port. On the 7.4, it's a 3.2 generation 2 USB connection that works at 10 GB per second versus 5 GB per second on the 7.3. Also, the 7.4 can work with a wide LAN connection if you buy an optional LAN to USB-C adapter. One thing to be aware is that the terminal covers and the cables connected to the headphone or USB ports can get in the way of the LCD screen on the 7.4, depending on its position. The covers can be removed, or at least I couldn't find a way to do it without risking damaging them. The battery is the same for the two cameras, the NP-FZ100. In my experience, the battery on the 7.4 drains more quickly, I would say about a 10-15% to worse performance in comparison to the 7.3. Finally, we have the memory cards. Both cameras feature two memory card slots that accept SD cards. On the 7.3, slot number one is UHS-2 compatible, whereas slot number two is UHS-1 only. On the 7.4, both slots can work with the faster UHS-2 cards, and what's more, slot number one also accepts the CFexpress Type-A card, which provides faster writing and reading speed. What you need to know is that there aren't a lot of CFexpress Type A cards on the market at the time of publishing this video, and they are rather expensive. To give you an example, the ProGrade 160GB CFexpress card that I have can be found around $360, whereas a SanDisk UHS-2 Extreme Pro 128GB is less than $200. Hopefully, in the future, the price of CFexpress cards will decrease. For photography, the advantage of the CFexpress card are mainly two. Better buffer capabilities, as I'll show you later on, and you can also transfer your images more quickly to your computer with a proper card reader. However, if none of these things are a priority for you, then I would not spend the extra money. The 73 features a 24.2 megapixel sensor with a back illuminated structure or BSI. The S74 has 33 megapixels, so a 27% increase, and uses a BSI design as well. As you can see in our first example, when both images are enlarged at roughly 100%, details appear a bit larger and a bit crisper on the S74. This is valid for RAW and JPEG. The S73 has a low-pass filter, whereas there are contrasting statements on the internet across websites, YouTube videos, and forums concerning the 7.4. So I took a picture of a dark jacket that has very thin lines and that caused Moiré to appear on previous cameras I tested. I added a generous amount of saturation to the raw files to make the difference more visible for the sake of the test. I also included the 7R Mark III, which doesn't have an AA filter. As you can see, there is more moiré on the 7.4 than the 7.3, although it is not as bad as the 7R Mark III. If there is a low-pass filter on the new camera, it is very weak. The two cameras have the same ISO range, 100 to 51,200, which is the normal range, or 50 to 204,800 with extended values. The quality is very similar overall. If you look carefully, you can see a bit more noise on the 7.4, but the difference is hardly relevant until ISO 51000. If you're working with JPEGs, each camera has a noise reduction setting with three levels. The results are similar when it is turned off, otherwise I find it to be slightly more aggressive on the 7.4 files. The 7.4 has an advantage when it comes to shadow recovery. 
as you can see, it shows less noise and less color artifacts after an heavy exposure adjustment in Lightroom. With a less intense three stops recovery, the S7 IV remains superior. Concerning the highlights, you can recover the same amount of details in overexposed areas with both cameras. An addition on the S7 IV is the possibility of choosing a third compression option for the RAW files, which is lossless compressed. On the S7 III, it's either compressed or uncompressed. In terms of file size, the scene I just showed you, captured with three compression settings, gave me the following. The lossless version is close to the compressed version in terms of file size. As for the quality, a strong four stops exposure recovery didn't highlight a relevant difference between the three raw versions. The 74 inherits Sony's latest color palette and image processing. It also has a brand new set of picture profiles called Creative Look. There are 10 of them, and each one can be customized with 8 different parameters. The S7 III features the old creative style that has been around since next APC cameras. There are 13 of them, with only 3 parameters to edit for each. What I noticed from the start when comparing the two cameras is that the S7 IV leans towards a more greenish look. This is visible with the RAW files, if all the basic settings are equalized, as well as the picture profiles on the JPEG. If I zoom in on the Vivid profile, you can see that the hill in the background has more patches of vibrant green when using the S7 IV. Also, the sky is more cyan compared to the version captured by the S7 III. If we turn our attention to skin tones, with the raw files, the S7 III has stronger reds and a hint of magenta, which makes the photo a bit on the cool side, whereas the S7 IV has a warmer look. That is, with the same exact settings on Lightroom using the Adobe Color Profile. With JPEG and the standard profile, it is the S7 IV that displays more reds on the face. Switch to the portrait profile, and the look is more subtle. The Mark IV model maintains more red, but shows smoother transition between the various shades of colors. Also, I don't like the color of my lips on the 73 portrait style. It almost looks like I'm wearing some lipstick and it is unrealistic when compared to the rest of the face. The neutral profile decreases the saturation, but here too I find the 74 to have a more consistent rendering on the skin, and in this case the Mark III model is back on the magenta tone. New to the S74 is the soft skin effect setting that, as the name suggests, gives skin tones a smoother look. There are three levels to choose from. The low level is very subtle and it's difficult to discern a difference at first, although the strongest wrinkles are reduced if you look under the eye, for example. With medium, the effect starts to be apparent, whereas the high level is invasive and unrealistic. Note that this setting applies to the JPEG only. The A7 III features 693 phase detection points that cover approximately 93% of the sensor surface. The A7 IV increases the AF coverage slightly to 94% with a total of 759 phase detection points. The contrast detection points are the same on both cameras, and there are 425 of them. Sony has mentioned various improvements concerning the autofocus. Now, some of them are minor differences in my opinion. For example, in single autofocus, the S7 IV is a bit quicker and more responsive, and it also has one extra stop of sensitivity in low light, but you will need very specific situation to notice any of this. A more interesting improvement is that phase detection autofocus works down to f22 on the S7 IV versus f11 on the S7 III when using continuous shooting speed. This means I can use the 200 600mm with the 2 times teleconverter, where the largest aperture becomes f13 at 600mm, and maintain full autofocus performance on the 74 when using the burst mode. With the same setup on the 73, only contrast detection is available, and focus is locked on the first frame when using the mid, high, or high plus burst mode. Then we have what I consider the two most important differences between these two cameras, IAF and tracking. Let's start with IAF. In my first test with a human subject, the S74 gave me a keeper rate of 80% while the person moved back and forth, 
whereas the A7M3 couldn't do better than 60%. The older camera struggled to keep focus in the middle of the action, and when the person walked away from the camera, it gave me more autofocus shots as a result. The A7 IV also offers additional settings to control IIF, like for example the possibility of prioritizing the left or right eye, a very useful setting to assign to a custom button when taking portraits, and a feature I often miss on the A7 III. IIF can be combined with the tracking mode. The A7 III has the old version called Lock-On AF, and it struggled to keep focus on the subject when she turned around and the face became hidden momentarily. Also, the camera was less prompt to prioritize IIF when lock-on was activated. On the 7.4, there is what Sony calls real-time tracking that can analyze the scene on different levels, brightness, depth, color, focus, face, and eyes. It is much more precise, and the face and eyes of a subject are always prioritized when detected. IAF also works with a vast range of animals on both cameras, but only the A7 IV can recognize birds. Where it surprised me the most was with small birds perched on a tree, and thin branches covering part of the body or even part of the head. The camera managed to keep focus on the eye and avoiding misfocusing on nearby branches in the foreground. It wasn't perfect every single time, but with any other setting, that would have resulted in the bird being out of focus. IAF also helps to ensure that the head of the bird is in focus, rather than the body, something that can happen when you're working at a close distance from the subject. And it makes composition easier to manage because you don't have to bother moving a small autofocus point on the body or head of the animal. With that said, IAF for birds is not perfect and there are a few things you need to be aware of. First, animals and birds are two separate settings in the menu the camera won't automatically switch from one to the other. You need to choose manually which type of subject you want to track. Second, it is important to combine it with the tracking mode and start focusing on the bird's body initially, if possible with a clear view, meaning no elements in front that can confuse the autofocus. The camera will then automatically go for the eye if detected or stay on the body if no eyes are visible. In this sequence with the robin, the bird was initially covered by a few branches and the camera misfocused. I moved a bit closer, tried again and the camera focused successfully. From there, it kept tracking the eye even when the bird moved a bit and went behind a branch. Third, eyes are not always detected depending on the species of bird. For example, with ducks, the eye area often stayed on the body, especially when the face was in the shade. It also confused the eye with another part of the body on occasion. If the bird is too far away and doesn't fill a good portion of the frame, the eye might not be detected at all. The old tracking mode on the A7 III, Lock-On AF, is not very reliable when it comes to fast subjects such as birds in flight. Often, the focus air will jump away from the bird and focus on something on the background, or even occasionally on the blue sky. So, my favorite setting is Zone Area combined with Level 5 for the AF tracking sensitivity and focus priority in continuous AF. With the 7 IV, on the other hand, real-time tracking is good enough I can use it for such challenging subject, and in fact it proved to be the best setting to use with my Red Kite test. With the zone area, the camera occasionally focuses on the background, especially if such background has similar colors to the bird's feather. With tracking, however, such behavior doesn't happen. You just have to make sure you start focusing when the bird is right under the tracking area at the center of the frame. Here are the results I got from a red kite test. The best score with the 7.4 is really close to that of the A9 and A9 Mark II. The S7 III is not too far, but I never managed to push it to the same level. Although the performance of the S7 IV is really good, I noticed a lack of consistency. Sometimes it would nail a sequence perfectly, other times there would be 5 or 6 shots out of focus, or slightly soft. So you can end up with a lower score than the one I showed you, and that can also happen with the S7 III. The two products feature a mechanical and electronic first curtain and a fully electronic shutter mode. 
they can take pictures up to 1 8,000th of a second. The shutter sound is quieter on the Mark IV model, which makes the camera a bit more discreet when using the mechanical mode. Both cameras have a maximum continuous shooting speed of 10 frames per second, but the 7 IV has a few limitations to be aware of. If you select uncompressed or lossless compressed RAW, the speed drops to 6 frames per second. So, to maintain 10 frames per second on the new camera, you need to stick with compressed RAW or JPEG. The 73, on the other hand, can achieve 10 frames per second with any type of file. At 10 frames per second, both cameras show you the last image taken in rapid succession. This means you have an uninterrupted view, no blackouts, but what you see is not live, it's the images being recorded on the SD card, meaning there is a delay to take into account. Up to 8 frames per second, you have live view with blackouts. The electronic shutter doesn't offer any advantage concerning the live view mode or the continuous shooting speed, unlike the A9 or A1 series. If you're still interested in using it to take pictures in silent mode, for example, you need to remember limitations such as distortion when panning quickly, for example, also known as the rolling shutter effect. Here, the A7 III defends itself well by distorting a bit less in comparison to its successor. Another problem of using the electronic shutter can be banding, which occurs under certain type of artificial light sources like LED, and can result in darker or brighter horizontal stripes in your image. In this scene, you can see there is a lot of flickering. I can try to adjust the shutter speed to reduce it, but it doesn't go away. And if I take a picture with the electronic shutter, there are thick dark lines covering the entire images and making the photo unusable. To tackle this, Sony has included on the 74 a function called variable shutter. It allows you to adjust the shutter speed to a higher degree of precision than the default one first step and see in real time on the monitor the impact it has regarding flickering. Now I'm trying to find the exact frequency to get rid of the banding and it seems that 64.2 is the right one. Note how it is still present at 64.4, but not 64.2. If I take another picture, this time there is no banding at all. Keep in mind that banding is not always something that is easy to see, depending on the specific light and its characteristic. Sometimes you will need to zoom in on an image to actually notice that something is wrong. So when you are on a location, always try to take some test shots if you can. Note that the variable shutter is different from the anti-flicker mode that you also find in the 73. Anti-flicker only works for still photos and only for the mechanical shutter, not the electronic mode. It is designed to adjust the continuous shooting speed to match the 100Hz or 120Hz frequencies. With a variable shutter, however, you can detect frequencies in between those values or even higher, as I just demonstrated. I tested an uninterrupted burst of 30 seconds to see if and when the frame rate will slow down and by how much. With the CF Express card, the 74 maintained full speed for the whole time. With the SD card, however, the Mark IV model slowed down with all except the JPEG file. The 73 struggles to go past 10 seconds at full speed with RAW, and even with JPEG, the speed slows down after about 17 seconds. Both cameras feature in-body image stabilization that works on 5 axes. The A7 III has a rating of 5 stops of compensation, whereas the A7 IV has 5.5 stops. On paper, this looks like a minor improvement. As usual, I took 10 pictures in a row at various shutter speed using the same lens to see which cam would give me the best keeper rate and at which speed. Here are the results. As you can see, the new camera has an advantage over its predecessor when taking pictures handheld between 1 4th of a second and 1 15th of a second. What is curious is that the 7 III keeper rate easily changes depending on the lens used. For example, with the 55mm f1.8, the performance is much closer to the 7 IV from 1 4th of a second. This lack of consistency is something I have witnessed several times with many A7 cameras. If you have a wide angle or standard zoom lens with optical stabilization, the result can improve a little. For example, I was able to take a sharp image at half a second 
with the 7.3 and the 24-105mm f4 in a previous test. That said, as a general rule, I would stay above one tenth of a second for a good keeper rate. I think it is interesting to start this conclusion by analyzing the year in which each camera arrived on the market. In 2018, Sony still had to prove it was a worthy contender against Canon and Nikon, and the 7 III, alongside the 7 r 3 and the A9, proved just that. It wasn't just about quality and performance, but it also included things people were asking in order to consider Sony more seriously, like dual card slots, an AF joystick, and better battery life. The 7 r 3 ticked all those boxes, and I think this is why it can be perceived more quote, revolutionary, than its successor. The 7 IV arrived in 2021 when Sony had nothing left to prove when it comes to quality, performance, and sales. It is a major player of the full-frame camera market, so the successor is about refinement, keeping the series up to speed with the natural evolution of technology, and keep it competitive with rival brands. The 7 III is a camera I know very well. I bought it as soon as it came out in 2018, initially for review purpose on my website, and I've compared it to many other cameras. I also use it occasionally for paid or personal work. While the 7 IV might seem less exciting at first, testing it for more than a month convinced me that, indeed, it is an excellent upgrade. You get better ergonomics, more customization, an improved EVF and better touch capabilities. There is more sensor resolution and dynamic range, without sacrificing much at high ISO. Tracking autofocus is more reliable, eye autofocus has improved and also works with birds. There are also a lot of extra features and settings I decided not to mention not to make this video too long. For example, the S7 IV allows you to shoot in HDR format for stills or use the camera as a webcam with a simple USB connection, without the need to install a plugin on your computer. And there are many subtle but useful improvements like being able to change the color or the autofocus area. Not everything is worth the upgrade, for sure. There is no real benefit with continued shooting speed or the electronic shadow performance, and the in-body image stabilization doesn't offer a substantial improvement for photography. And actually, in-body stabilization is one aspect of Sony full-frame cameras that hasn't really improved since the first iteration with the 7 Mark II in 2014. And then we have the price, where the 7 IV is the more expensive choice. That's it, that's the end of part one of my in-depth comparison. I hope you enjoyed it. As usual, if you have any question, don't hesitate to leave a comment and I'll respond as soon as I can. On my website, mirrorlesscomparison.com, you will find a text version of this comparison and there you also find extra information, extra features that I haven't included in this video just not to make it too long. And as a reminder, if you want to know more about the video capabilities of these two cameras, then there is a second part of this comparison. You will find the link in the description below when it becomes available. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.